Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, thank you for joining us today. So today we're going to look at um, developing export markets post Brexit and, and what Brexit really means for export business and uh, and the changes that it's brought about. Um, so my name is Mike Wilson. I'm uh, CEO of a company called Go Exporting. Um, as the name suggests, we specialize in helping companies <clears throat> to expand into international markets. Um, Brexit's become pretty much a speciality for us over the last few few years, couple of years. Um, so today we're going to look at the, as I say, the how export has been affected by Brexit and how to manage those challenges and, and look for the opportunities in, in, in exporting post Brexit. So we'll have a quick look at some of the implications of the, the main points of this, the trading cooperation agreement and then how EU, the EU changed exporting in the first place and what effect that has on, on how we move forward. As I say, just quickly about ourselves, we're, we're a specialist export company successfully launching business into new international markets and uh, I've over 30 years experience in, in international business. So the main points of the trade and cooperation agreement, I'm sure you're all familiar with these now. One of the main issue that everyone was happy about at the beginning was that there was no tariffs or quotas on UK and EU goods. They could travel uh, quite freely between um, the different regions. But of course, when you dig down into the agreement a little bit deeper, it becomes a little bit more complicated as rules of origin apply. And we have a concept of bilateral accumulation uh, under the agreement, which we'll talk about more this afternoon if anyone's joining us on, on that uh, webinar. Um, but even so, there are, there are some complications there around if you import something from the EU and send it back to the EU in the same condition, then it, uh, it doesn't become a UK good and duty would apply. Um, that's the Percy Pig example from Marks and Spencers, which many people will have heard about. Customs procedures and documentation we all know about. There's been a lot of uh, press about that. Dispatches have become exports, arrivals have become imports, and uh, the VAT implications of that. The agreement did bring in mutual recognition of authorised um, exporter or economic operator schemes, which um, is, is, is useful. Um, product and rec rec regulatory compliance requirements uh, were brought in. Uh, there's no agreement on financial services, which was uh, a problem for um, the, the City of London. And, um, you know, there's talk now that we're going to the WTO to, to try and uh, get us some kind of agreement on financial services there instead. There is sort of an agreement or a framework on mutual recognition of professional qualifications, but um, there are, it's only a framework at this time and it's not guaranteed in each country is, to, is using its own rules, basically. Business travel, we can go 190 days in every 180 in, into Europe, um, but there are certain business travel where you would need a visa or a, a work permit. For example, if you're going to carry out a service contract uh, in, a, in the EU, you would need a, 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 um, a visa there. Um, it's the first EU trade agreement that's included a digital trade agreement. Um, so that's uh, that's good. The EU has finally accepted the GDPR uh, in the UK is, is the same as the EU. So that's uh, just recently been agreed. Trademarks, we've incorporated EU trademarks into UK law, so that's that's not a problem. And the agreement does include an enforcement mechanism. So if um, we do anything that they don't, the EU, EU doesn't like and vice versa, there is a way of that, that being enforced or a, a mechanism to, to try and rectify that. And we may get to that situation with with Northern Ireland, as we've seen, because we just extended re, uh, relaxed um, regulations until 2023 for, for supermarkets, for example, which um, the EU is not too happy about and is threatening legal action on that. So those are some of the, the uh, main points from the trade and cooperation agreement. And the reason I mention them when we're talking about export is that uh, they do have an effect. They have an effect on and there are implications. You know, so that means when we're exporting now that we need a HS code, the, the um, customs code, an EORI number. We've got customs declarations, customs duties, depending on your products, sanitary and phytosanitary certificates are required. Strategic controls and licenses, for example, rules of origin we've already mentioned, VAT changes, how is your import VAT is due um, on any shipment into the EU from now on. 
uh, approvals and CE markings, changes there, inco terms, who is the importer, who is the importer, that can have a, uh, an, an effect, your distributor might not want to be the, the importer of record because they, it brings added responsibilities. And of course there are uh, rules, implications for e-commerce and changes uh, in that as well. So those are all new, if you like, barriers to entry for dealing with the EU um, that came into force from the 1st of January. And that does have, uh, as I say, an effect on um, how we approach export moving forward and the, which countries are going to be best for us to, to start looking at. But by no means is Brexit the only challenge. Uh, we're living in an uncertain world. Of course, we have the um, COVID-19 global pandemic, but there are constant changes which affect strategy and affect our export strategy. We have a surprise election results, where, like when Donald Trump won, and so, for example, um, and you know changes of a pushback against uh, all sorts of uh, different situations which arrive, which may arise, which may change the strategy that we follow. Recession, for example. We've seen ex accelerated technolo technological change, exponential growth of um, global data and digital technologies, changing business forever. Teams calls, Zooms calls, for example, <clears throat> changing the way we sell, which we'll look at a little bit later as well. Um, public awareness of environment and dissatisfaction within inequalities. Uh, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, Marcus Rashford's campaign and so on. All of these things are, are uh, new challenges or new um, obstacles that we that we have to to take into account when we're looking at uh, at our export strategies. Um, so that's led to you know corporate social responsibilities growing in importance. Because of all these changes, uh, the Boston uh, Consulting Group has coined this concept of always on change. So we're always needing to look at how we can change, uh, what changes we need to make to keep ahead of the the market or to keep up with the market and uh, to make sure we're in the right place for, for our exports in, in this case. So we're gonna have a quick look at um, how the EU changed exporting, the historic perspective, uh, free trade effect and the psychological change that that brought in consumers, for example. So as we can see um, that um, you know, we're looking here specifically at, at export. So if we're looking at the UK trade balance as, as a percentage of GDP over, over time, we joined the uh, EU in, in sort of 1972. As you can see, that was a, a sort of low point for uh, UK's trade of balance, and then it shot up. So we, we came into a positive situation. So you could say that the EU helped um, the British economy in that time. Over, over a period, it's now declined again, but it was a, you know, it was a very important period that um, you know, from, from 1973 onwards that we, we started to grow and we came out of recession until we hit the recessions of the, of the 1980s and we recovered slowly. And as we can see on, on the right hand side of this, of this graph, um, the different regions, so we're still operating a trade deficit with, with the EU, um, so we're importing more than we're exporting. And um, but in other areas like Americas, we're, we're positive uh, and so on. So, but it's as we can see from the, the left hand graph, it's services which are pulling everything forward. Our trading goods is generally um, a negative effect. So, where are our biggest export markets? The EU is, you know, is definitely uh, one of our key export areas. But as we can see, our biggest is still. Um, the US at the top here, 20.5% of our exports go to, to the EU. This is from, from 2019. China is also a big area. So we, we were already, even before Brexit, exporting to a lot of, of different countries, with the EU being, you know, obviously a, one of our major partners. So what was the, the effect of joining the EU? Well, we had the free trade effect. So it's not surprising that UK businesses place greater emphasis on the EU with their export sales and marketing strategy after we joined. Because we had this single market, it was easy to do business, there were common rules, free movement of goods, free movement of, of people eventually, and a huge market to go at, a population of 450 million. GDP of 13.94 trillion, which is 16% of world GDP, 
third only behind China and the USA, who are only slightly ahead at 16.4 and 16.3 percent. Yeah, yet as we saw, you know, the USA is still our biggest trading partner with 20 percent of, of exports. So, you know, China and, uh, and the USA, we, we don't have a trade agreement with either of them. So we've managed to trade quite happily with, with both of them, um, even, even without a trade agreement. So what was the psychological change with uh, being part of the EU? Over time, the EU became increasingly powerful and influential uh, in, in the near region and further afield. More and more countries have looked to join and it's become, you know, become part of this single market. We're unique so far and wanting to go the other way. More still are looking to join, for example, Turkey. Um, and the introduce, introduction of the euro was in, we created this feeling of being European for the countries that, that followed that. So it became this identity as European. And then yeah, started to think about EU origin and not national origin. Um, and that's, again, that's a, that's a key point that we'll see when we're looking at um, exporting moving forward. So, you know, we, um, EU origin became accepted almost the same as a national origin. And there's a psychological shift there. And this lead, led to changes in emphasis of marketing campaigns to from EU you know, to EU from German or, or French and, and so on. And there's an acceptance of a European message. You know, but however, when there are times of challenge, then we do tend to get protectionists and nationalists um, rises to the to the fore. And that probably ultimately led to to the UK um, vote to, to leave. But there is this psychological change that, that happened as part of the EU membership. So what, what effect does that have? What effect does that all have on exporting? We're going to look at this now you know, in more detail on how, and how we analyse our and plan our exports moving forward. So the psychological effect, well, what is the psychological effect of Brexit? Well, customers no longer consider the UK as, a Euro, as European. Um, and that could be that they decide to, you know, switch their uh, allegiance to, to local suppliers, EU suppliers, rather than um, rather than the UK, for example. So that could have an effect on, on business. We're seeing that a little bit, for sure. Uh, certainly seeing it in acceptance of the new trading rules and customs declarations where EU customers are saying, well, you know, we didn't vote for Brexit. We, we don't want any hassle. You, you, you supply to us in the same way as you did before, which brings all sorts of implications in terms of VAT and so on for, for UK companies. The equally UK consumers may have the same thought in, in reverse. So we get this kind of siege mentality perhaps where, where there's a bit more um, looking at local supply rather than um, foreign supply. So don't, over, don't overlook your local market and whether there are uh, opportunities in the in the local market as well as overseas markets because of Brexit. You know, there could be a sort of buy local agenda which comes about because people are fearing shortages, for example, that's one one reason. Uh, and just a little bit of the unknown and as I say, this psychological effect. But when we're looking at where to export to, um, one of the biggest things that we look at with uh, with our clients is the barriers to trade, the barriers to entry in a particular market. And of course, there are some Brexit has brought about some real new barriers that, that weren't there, as we've seen with the EU. So we've got customs declarations, duties and VAT changes, licenses and permits, um, approvals and so on, importer costs and cash flow implications, currency fluctuations, maybe greater fluctuations there. So that's you know it's there needs to be a re-evaluation of, of of those re relationships and export markets based on what the barriers to trade are um, it could be that your customers are looking for alternatives it's estimated 60 percent have already looked so you know have you received that order you were expecting um, if not it's it'd be worth talking to to your clients so what does this mean for you for your uh, export business I mean, one of the key first things you have to do is take positive action to maintain your current business. You know, before we start looking at, at other areas of the world, the EU is still our biggest trading partner, just about, and we need to, to maintain that business. It's still close by. So before anything else, keep your customers. 
this is the the first challenge you know for for exporters um, that, that we see and we're advising clients on make sure you make it easy perfect execution we call it so make sure you can deliver to your clients as easily as possible post brexit as compared to to prior to brexit and so don't be passive and hope it'll be all right you know there are these psychological barriers that we talked about and the actual barriers to trade and these are real issues that um that need to be taken into account and, and account you know and, and accounted for so plan you know, hopefully already planned for for brexit you know have you how well are your plans going have you considered all the implications not only for your business but also for your customers so make it as a priority so this i believe is the most immediate challenge for your export sales and, and your marketing strategy um, and how you know and, and in assessing your export strategy moving forward keep them close by that we mean keep your customers close when was the last time you spoke to your customer do you know how what or how they're feeling um, about you post brexit about buying from the uk have they been looking around at uh, other uh, potential suppliers take their concerns seriously because you can easily lose them and years years and years of relationship can go overnight so keep them close um, keep keep talking to them and address their issues do you under you really understand their issues and concerns um, <clears throat> you really need to as a, as a matter of urgency do they know the plans you put in place to ensure everything runs smoothly post brexit if not why not you, you need to communicate this to them communication is critical with uh, with your customers your current customers at the moment maintaining the business this business don't be caught out you, know, you have to maintain this business and say this is the most immediate challenge make sure you don't lose any of the business that, uh, that you've also got and then of course what about other eu opportunities you may not be selling to all the eu countries and once you've gone through this process of planning for brexit you might as well use that knowledge to to look at the opportunities in other eu countries you know now how to do it are there other countries you could be selling to you know set up a local distribution to supply to set up to satisfy your local customers maybe um, that that can help with supplying into other countries as well I mean, by saying you've got an eu uh, distribution point market this benefit to customers in, in other regions in other areas um, but in all the time all this you must follow a process to assess the market opportunities which we'll go through a little bit later a scientific approach to assessing which are the best countries and the best areas to to look at rather than just taking it as a you know what comes along um, it's better to to actually plan for it and take a scientific approach to assessing different markets so positive action maintain your current business what about your value proposition uh, many people think of value proposition proposition as just the way you sell a product but it, it really is an ex it's a strategic choice as well it's um, it's the way um, it should be the starting point for your for your strategy and how you build your strategy is because that's what makes you and your product stand out and gets you away from being a commodity product you know how can you add value how do you add value to your product and, and how does that add value to your customers <clears throat> and if we're going to look at new markets that value proposition may be different it may be different in different uh, in different countries because of their requirements in those particular countries so it's something which is a, a moving piece and may not be the same everywhere so review your value proposition you know and also look at how you can increase the value by using technology for example using data we'll look a little bit more at that in, in uh, a little bit later on innovation but build value so you can gain customers and build value so you can increase returns so the value proposition is becomes the starting point if you like create value for your customers and you know and the money will flow it's, it's how you you you'll be perceived how you operate whether it's cost-based or value-based um, and with Brexit, the value proposition needs to be completely reviewed. Uh, it may have shifted Brexit challenges. Customers in France may say maybe looking for local suppliers due to red tape, due to delays. So your value proposition needs to include how you make buying from you easy um, and so on. Um, so 
really review the value proposition and don't think of it as uh, a once off um, idea. It's something that needs to be looked at for, for each region you start to look at. The same with marketing and communications. Um, you know, you need to adjust your marketing message to emphasize that you're ready to help clients to, you know, to overcome Brexit hurdles. Convey to the market that you're ready and you're dealing with your post, dealing with your post Brexit will be the same. So you're giving us a strategic message of confidence uh, following Brexit. And you need to communicate that with all the stakeholders. So it, internally as well as externally. Uh, your direct mess marketing message on the products and service may change. You know, you may need to change your, your overall message based on the new, new value proposition we talked about. You may also want to say something like made in Britain or proud to include EU components, committed to the EU, something like this. But what is the, the what is the market demanding? What is the value that you're, you're adding to your, your product and your brand positioning? You know, do you need to adjust it based on the exit from the EU? Um, do you need you know, to enhance the, the, the UK side of it or do you need to show that you, know, you have a EU presence as well? Uh, these kind of things need to, be, need to be considered. And you also need to reflect cultural differences. If we start to look at different markets, if we start to look further afield to you know, in the Far East, for example, then you know, there are cultural differences that need to be taken into account in, in your marketing and, and maybe in your product and your packaging, for example. So these things need to, again, need to be considered as part of how we're going to um, look at our export markets moving forward. And as we saw earlier, um, CSR policies and actions are increasingly important, you know, and, and you need to constantly validate your, your credentials and, and communicate that to the market. Because one of the benefits of uh, Brexit is we can now look at, uh, not that we couldn't before, as we saw, we can always we could always look at new uh, countries, new new areas. But as we saw, the psychological effect and the historic effect of, of the being part of the EU meant that we we naturally looked at the uh, the EU, the near countries um, first, because it was easy to trade there. It was almost like selling at home. Um, but now we know that it's selling to the EU is the same as selling to Canada or to the US or Brazil. In many ways, that a lot of the procedures that we have to follow will be the same. So once we have that knowledge, then it's, it makes sense to look at where the new opportunities are. And there you go, it's, it's, it's reckoned 135,000 UK businesses have only sold to the EU previously. So it's been easy up to now. Now we need to review all the markets. You know, have you considered Asia? It's a huge market, it's not only in China and India, but also Vietnam and, and other countries. What about Latin America? Colombia is a fast developing economy, for example. Um, how do you narrow down those options though? Firstly, knowledge and, not, and logic. Of course, we can look at, you know, we know that the US is going to be a bigger market than the Maldives, for example. So there are some levels of, of you know, existing knowledge and logic there that we can use. We can use our in-house data. Where have we had inquiries from? Where have we had orders from? Is there a trend there that we can pick out by reviewing it and seeing where you know might be a good market for our for our product or service? It's um, where is it being accepted or is it seeming to be attractive to to customers? You can also learn from your competitors. Uh, where are they selling to? Which countries do they operate in, or have they got a distributor in? Uh, that will give you some indication maybe of where the market is and uh, where opportunities are, again lie. So it's uh, again, it's important to, to consider all of these options. Market research, of course, you can do, you can buy market research or you can get a, you know, an independent company like ourselves to, do, to research a particular market for you. Um, look at the market opportunities that, that are there, the size of the market and the barriers to entry and, and so on so you can assess the market properly before you go somewhere. And of course now, one of the key ways we can look at an where, you know, where narrow down the options is with free trade agreements. This is one point pointer to where to look at. It's not the only consideration, but it is one pointer and it will bring new opportunities. Um, so, for example, you know, we have the free trade agreement with Japan and, and Part of that agreement is actually more favourable to, to the UK companies 
particularly cheese manufacturers, it's known as the Stilton Agreement because it includes um, a, um, a, a key indicator for, for Stilton cheese in, in that, which the EU agreement with Japan didn't do. So there may be benefits like that that open up opportunities depending on your on your product. We also got agreements with Korea. It's worth keeping an eye on where all the new agreements are. There's the government website has a list of all the new agreements. We've just signed a new one with Ghana, for example. Maybe a country you've never thought of, but you know there may be opportunities there for your product or service. So keep an eye on where the trade agreements are and what the terms of those trade agreements are. Because once you're used to dealing with say international markets differently uh, compared to the EU, um, then you might as well look at all the markets, but assess the benefits of entering those those particular markets. So expand your horizons is, is basically what we're saying. The first step is to secure your current business with the EU. The next step is to expand those horizons. It's given the opportunity to look at where the best opportunities are Brexit. So, you know, not just at our near neighbours, but again, don't exclude the EU from consideration. There may be other countries in the EU um, block that you're not supplying to and may need to be assessed in, in the same way. So how else, you know, how do you narrow down the options? Is the size of the market the main thing? Well, not always because, you know, the US may be the biggest market for you or China, but there may be big challenges in actually entering that market. Um, a lot of competition, barriers to entry, for example, distance, language, there are all sorts of issues that can potentially come into the decision making process. Your product may not be exactly adapted to that particular market. You may need to make changes to it or you may need to, to consider it or you know, it may not be what uh, people in that country are actually looking for. And then you do need to consider all of the barriers to entry approvals and licenses, trade body membership. Some, in some countries you need to be a member of a trade body in order to sell a particular product. For example, in Germany, if you want to sell bitumen products, it's not a law, but it's, it's a, uh, a usual practice that you're a member of a particular trade, a trade body to be able to, to sell into, into Germany and those types of products. Look at the competition. How strong is the competition? Don't be afraid of competition, but you do need to be aware of it. Uh, customs and duties, of course, it's a big, big barrier to entry. Rules of origin, which we, as again, we're going to talk about this afternoon. Logistics uh, can be an issue. How far away is it? Does how much is that going to add to the cost? For example, language can be can be a big challenge as well. So again, we need to look at all of these things. Currency again, what are what are what are the currency risks? What currencies are you prepared to deal in or are able to deal in? Uh, what about exchange rates and, and so on? So all of these factors need to be taken into account, as do country risks. What's the risk of that particular country? Um, you know, it may appear on the face of it to, to be stable, but, but is it really? Um, I often tell, tell the story of uh, Cemex, the Mexican cement manufacturer that uh, had a big presence in, in Venezuela. And then almost overnight, the Venezuelan government nationalized the, all of their business without paying them proper compensation. And even to this day, they've not really been compensated for it. So do take into account country risks uh, in your decision-making process. But how do you do that? How do you evaluate and compare one country compared to another? Uh, we can look at all of those different factors we've discussed, but you need a way of being able to assess them. Uh, and not just by your gut feeling, not just by, you know, is, is, is this working? Um, is this going to work for me or I think it's going to be OK or it's, you know, I've had a, an inquiry from a distributor. Let's let's look at that market. It needs to be a scientific approach. Uh, list all of the factors that are going to affect your evaluation. So market size, growth rate. Again, growth rate can be more important than the market size. If the market's big but it's declining compared to another market which is growing um, and it doesn't have the competition, then maybe better to look at that particular market. Uh, also look at all of the barriers to entry that we've just discussed. So look at all of these factors. And what we do when we're doing this evaluation with, our, with the clients is we assign an importance weighting to each factor. So we, which are the most important to that particular client uh, for, e for each of those different things, market size, growth, the different barriers to entry and so on. And then we assess, give each one a rating for each country. 
maybe between one and five. I'm going to show an example of this in a moment so you can see uh, what, we, what, we, what we mean and the, the, the template will be available afterwards if you want to see it. So by doing this, we generate a score for each factor, rate the rating times the weighting, uh, and that gives us, we sum that up to get a total country score. And that allows us in a scientific way to compare one country to another and to create a league table of, of priorities for, for where we're going to look at for, for our exports. So it's not, it's not just a finger in the air job, we're doing taking a scientific approach to it because exporting, as we know, does take time, it takes money, it, can, and it takes commitment. So you want to make sure that you're committing yourself into the right areas. So this is the, the format that we use that we've just shown. So you can see down there, the left hand side here, we've got the selection factors and market size, growth rate, uh, all the different barriers to entry. You can change this for each, each market or specific to, you know, to your types of products or service. Um, product adaptation to market, brand awareness, country risk and so on. And then how we rate them, one low, five high for market size, uh, what rating we give it and then the weighting that, that we've uh, applied to that particular um, factor that, that, uh, for, for our decision making process. So in this case we've got 20% on the market size, 5% on growth, 50% of our decision making is based on barriers to entry. Uh, and then 10% on how well our products adapted to that particular market, 5% on brand awareness, 10% on, on country risk. Now, these, these may not apply to, to you. You may want to, you know, you may change these or in discussions we may change these. It does vary, but so this is just gives you an idea of how we do it. So in this case, when we multiply it all out, we get a score for this particular country of 16.5. Well, what does that mean? We, we prioritize it as such. So a score of less than eight is a low priority and a prime target is, is over 16. So in that particular example, we just looked at it was 16 and a half. So that was a prime target for us to look at that particular country. It was going to give us a, it the right size of market and the barriers to entry were, were uh, you know, we were able to overcome them or were, were not as stringent as they may be in some, some other countries. And our product was, was aligned to the market. So we, we have we now we have a means of scientifically analyzing which are going to be the best markets for us to look at and to create a leap table so that we can we can look at which is the best areas for us to go to. And that's important because one of the things that we we always say to clients is, you know, when you're going into export markets is, is the it's so important is focus is to don't overstretch yourself. Don't think you can do everywhere at once. Not, not You can't do everywhere uh, perfectly and, and put the right amount of effort into it um, if, you, if you try and do too many countries in one go. A company I worked with had um, two examples, two salespeople. One salesperson actually had 30 countries that he was covering and another one had five. Uh, and they were both bringing in about the same amount of business, but the one with five was obviously bringing in more profits because his, his costs were lower uh, and he was penetrating the market much deeper, particularly in one country. He was getting 50, 60 percent market share, whereas the guy with 30 countries was doing was doing well overall, but he was only skimming the surface in the countries. So we switched it. So we focused, made him focus on this top five markets. Uh, and then just reacting the other markets and, and reassign some of them. And he almost doubled his sales. So by being able to focus, he was able to dig deep in, into the markets and create more opportunities. So yeah, so don't overstretch, focus on, on the right markets, match your ambition to your resources. It's no point saying I'm going to go to 160 countries if you've only got one person. Um, you know, or, or know people specifically for, for export, which you see in some companies. So serve one market well, not five superficially is, is, uh, is our recommendation. And avoid what I hate, which is called touch and go selling. So that's where you'll go to a market, you'll spend a few, couple of months there, you'll generate lots of contacts and you start to, to get some interest. You know, it takes a bit of time, you start to get some interest, but then something happens at home or in a different market. And you come away and you, you're, you're out of contact for two or three months and then you pick it up again because you've got a bit more time so you go back again touch and go selling 
And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, those customers that have gone a little bit cold on you, if not totally cold, so you're almost starting again. So avoid that. Put the effort in, focus on the markets, um, but be patient. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a bit of time to to do all of you know to do all of this and to break into the market. So once we decided which markets we're going to go to, how do we get to those markets? That's you know then that's may need to change now. It may need to be redefined um, and reviewed post Brexit. You know um, the, your normal route to market option might not still make sense. Your distributors may not be willing to be the importer of record, for example. Um, you might not want to send out confidential information to them all for them to be able to, to take on that role, for example. You know, so you may decide you need a master distributor or an initial importer in, 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 in the EU that takes on that challenge, or, or you're going to set up a, a business yourself, so the investment that we're talking about here. A lot of companies are now looking that we're increasingly seeing clients looking to to set up in the in the EU. So look at so this is the, is a distributor or agent, you know, is that the best way into the market? And don't forget if you do go that route that they're your biggest customer. You need to sell to them. You need to make choose them very carefully and you need to make sure that they're doing the job for you and putting in the required amount of effort into your business and they have the resources to be able to do that. So many times I've heard seen customers where they've picked a distributor and it's that's effectively blocked them going into the market. So don't assign, don't pick a distributor and then forget about them. You need to be working with them and making motivating them, making sure that they're doing their job. Uh, do you may want to recruit? That um, you know at least you've then got someone who's dedicated to your product. It can be a little bit more expensive seemingly to start with, but uh, you know overall once you get past a certain point, it's it's more cost effective to have your own person rather than a distributor or agent, and you may make quicker progress. But it depends obviously on the investment that you want to put in there. These days you can do a lot through direct sales and through you know e-commerce through websites. We'll look a little bit more about that later. It's a very important part of, of the, the sales process now, uh, websites and 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 e-commerce. But as I say, more and more companies are looking at investing uh, and having a local approach. So you have a local entity. Um, this is an approach which has been taken on by the likes of Honda, for example. They have a global footprint, but a localization approach. They have companies in each country, and that's that can help overcome some of the nationalism or or you know trade barriers and so on that uh, that can come about. So don't don't discount it. Another area of assessing where to go to is is the competition, the competition gap. It's an often a really overlooked area of sales and marketing strategy, which we see a lot of uh, clients don't don't look at at all. So review, understand your competitors. You know, review how uh, how they prepare for Brexit. Look at where where they're selling to. Where do they sell? How do they sell? What are their routes to market? You know, what's their marketing message and their value proposition that we looked at earlier? And review their strengths and strengths and weaknesses. You know, how have they prepared? Uh, they may have the, what we call the hedgehog strategy with, during these difficult times with with coronavirus and and Brexit. You know, the hedgehog strategy is where they're paralysed by fear. Then they're doing nothing, so they curl up in a ball and they cut back on on marketing and uh, generating leads. Uh, but it's a very short term approach because the market will soon forget uh, and will know that you've withdrawn from the market. So if it's possible, stay in the market. Yeah. Also look at your EU competitors. Have they left the UK? Have they, you know, because of these challenge, Brexit challenges, have they taken the decision you know, not to not to export here anymore? Particularly if it wasn't a big part of the business, you might find that. So you may find there are opportunities to take advantage of that. Uh, there may be less competition. There may also be more competition. We just don't know how that's going to work out yet. So, uh, but look at the competition, assess the competition, and review the different scenarios. Plan your sales and marketing strategy to to counter competition, but also, uh, in you know, look at them so you can see how to differentiate your business and as a guide for for, for getting you know for expanding your business. Innovation is, is another um, 
key area and a key and often it's not not a, a strategy innovation strategy is not something people usually think about through as regards export but it, but it, it is a key part again of you know whether your products are going to be correct for the market that you're going to brexit's created new challenges it's created but it's created new opportunities it's reducing traditional markets but there's new countries new customers and we're expanding potentially our global footprint but new regions may have different demands for products and different features and capabilities different design uh, different approvals different standards so this requires an innovation strategy you know how can you get your product aligned to the market what's it going to cost so, and to do that, you need to be aware of what your capability for innovation is. What are your resources that you can commit to it? This will affect your sales and marketing, your export strategy, because you know you can't. It may govern which countries you can go to, um, because you can't do everything at once. So, you need to to take that into account. Have a, a, a plan for innovation. And, and where you where you can invest in it and how long it's going to take. Develop your products um, and develop products to help solve Brexit challenges if that's if that's possible. Look for gaps in the market. We've seen, as we saw mentioned earlier, accelerated technological change. You know, data is is grown so so much and using data, and digital technologies. The reason there's a picture of a tractor there is because John Deere is a great example of this, the farm machinery manufacturer. They branched out, so they're not just supplying tractors anymore. They, they supply a, a software with their systems so that the farmer can see where all his machinery is, how it's performing, spread rates, how, and they can monitor outputs and yields, weather, max, how they can maximise results. So this has become a, a real draw for customers of, of John Deere. And that they, you know, they, again, it reduces the threat of competition because these people will keep buying John Deere machinery because they want to keep that system operating with with all of their all of their equipment that they have. So, you know, even if John Deere is more expensive, they're not going to buy Massey Ferguson. So, adding value to your products through technology is another way of um, looking at being able to expand your export markets and looking at and considering how innovation could benefit your, your customers. The same with process automation, not just in manufacturing, but also in sales and marketing, CRM systems, automation software, marketing automation, this kind of thing can all help to um, as we take them as part of an innovation to you know, take away menial tasks and, and really push your business forward into, into new markets. But you need to innovation in, in the sense of assessing what's required by the market and developing the products, but realizing what your resources and your capabilities are for that innovation. And that will help decide which countries you can actually look at. And one other key area is, is the actual sales leadership and, and the relationships with your customers. It's a, this is a key, actually a strategic decision post Brexit. It's, you know, in an uncertain world, leadership becomes you know, critical, becomes more critical. So how you lead your sales organization and really uh, build relationships with customers will be critical. Um, it requires deep consideration and strategic planning, therefore, and the message you affect will come, you will affect the performance of your business. You know, Brexit and COVID have created uncertainty uh, and in some cases a feeling of impending doom. And your sales and marketing team may be feeling it too, other people in your organization, your customers may be feeling it too. So it's important to have a calm, um, positive outlook and communicate what pre um, preparations you've made and carried out. So to show that you're ready for the challenge and that you know, no matter what happens, you're going to, you, you, you've addressed the, the, uh, the challenges and will continue to address the opportunities and will be positive. Um, so don't dwell on the past, move forward and move your organization forward uh, and this helps to build a stronger more transparent more responsive you know relationships both internally and externally post brexit <clears throat> yeah do this with your customers with your team and all stakeholders communication is key the message is critical getting that message out there that it's a positive approach you know, create a, a, an organization motivated to achieve a common goal Digital marketing, and we mentioned a little bit earlier, this is becoming increasingly important. 
74% of business to business buyers conduct over 50% of research online before, before purchasing offline. Let's just think about that for a moment. That's 74% of, of, of business to business transactions are all over 50% concluded, researched before they even contact you. Uh, that means you know you must give prospects enough information on your website so they can adequately research your products or service before contacting you. There's no longer room to keep information off your website and hope that uh, you know hope that prospects will call for it because they probably won't. They want to do the research online. If your competitors got the information, they'll probably go there for it. Uh, Google says that. Um, of those involved in business to business buying processes, they're already 50% of the way, 57% of the way down the path to a decision before they actually contact you, before they perform a, an operation <clears throat> on your site, an action on your site. So, you know, understand, so search engine optimization, understanding your keywords, use of content marketing, for example, these are all critical areas in in building your business and, and as we saw it can be a direct sale to to export markets as well by generating this this awareness driving business driving social through social media to your traffic traffic to your website yeah answer answer their questions this is an important uh, point so there's a, a great book by a guy called Matt marcus sheridan called they ask you answer and what he did he he revolutionized his business basically by looking at what his customers were asking and actually answering them on his website, building um, downloads and videos and so on, making sure he was answering the questions that his customers most wanted quite answering on the website. And that improved his business several fold and his conversion rates went sky high. So far from uh, giving too much information, he, he was actually, he actually had the, the, you know, the effect of improving his business. The great thing with digital marketing is it's cross-border, it's multinational. You can export, you know, quite easily now. Uh, it's highly targeted marketing. You can target different sectors, different people, different brand, uh, different uh, positions, promote your brand. The idea is become the thought leader for your particular market sector. Become the, the leader in the market. Use testimonials and referrals. So your digital strategy for 2021, gather reviews, share across social media, content and so on. It is a key area and then you know there are experts that can help you in that we we do a lot of work on in this ourselves you know i had a, someone the other day said uh, from south africa saying well how can when i search export consultants in south africa go exporting comes out number one well that's because of this kind of work that we do and this is how we increasing our, our business and so it's a key area for your export strategy so another thing to take into account we're all on zoom or we're on teams or other other way these kind of video calls all the time these days and of course this is how we're interacting with our customers at the moment uh, and then it, it will have changed has changed selling forever because even after the covid crisis is has hopefully gone away some of some of this will stay and check selling via zoom will will continue uh, but it's a different kind of selling. It's a different you know, way of, of selling compared to, to the old days where we would go out and we'd have dinner with someone, we'd have a drink with someone, you build a relationship. It's different kind of selling. You need to try, try and create that relationship electronically or, or through video, and that's a different approach. And it may not necessarily be that it comes naturally to, to your sales team or your export sales team. Uh, so, you know, look at that and, and consider you know, training on, on video selling. Uh, make sure that they have the online resources that they need to be able to satisfy a client so that they've, always, they've got everything to hand. Catalog links, sales focus frequently asked questions, standard emails, links to blogs, white papers, videos, you know, um, all sorts of things that, that anything that, that's going to support their, their process, make sure it's available electronically for them and easy for them to, to send out to, to potential customers. Um, and you need to develop those online resources and hold webinars, virtual open days. You know, everyone's getting a little bit jaded by webinars, but um, in a mix with, with personal visits and so on, then it's still important. And don't look overlook individualization either. So, you know, it's not just sending out the same thing to the same people. You know, each people, each one size doesn't fit all. 
uh, in today's interconnected world. So customers are they're individuals and they have different requirements. So treat them as such. So take in, take seriously, you know, selling in, Zo in the Zoom era is different to selling previously. So what, when we're talking to clients and when we're helping them with their strategy, these are the key areas that we look at for a, a sales strategy. So we always look at how can we enhance their core business first. Uh, look, in, look at how you can increase sales of your current products, improve those products to to uh, to gain bigger, better market share. You know whether it's performance, quality improvements, specifications, pricing discipline. Look at that carefully. If you can add one or two percent to your margin, what's that going to do to your bottom line? Look at the value added uh, proposal that you have and customer service and so on. So how do you enhance your core business with your, your current customers? And how do you make it more pro more profitable and greater market penetration? And look at how you extend your business. So with your current products and services, how can you extend that? Are there new categories that you can offer it to or new customers, new uses for the technology you already have? Look at ways you can extend the business in that way. And then finally, how can we expand the market? So how do we look at new areas of business we can move into, new opportunities, new innovation, new geographies that we've been talking about, new export markets. So it's a coordinated approach across those three E's as we, as we call them. So plan for Brexit um, and the challenges, embrace and change, uh, look at the new skills that we were all uh, learning from exporting to different countries and the EU, uh, maintain your current exports, that's the first key point, and then use your new skills to open you know, the world of opportunities, but make sure you've carefully assessed those markets and decide how you're going to go to market very carefully. Look at your leadership and innovation strategies and how they're going to affect your export strategies. Digital marketing is, is a key area, and as we've said, look at the selling techniques in the, in the Zoom sorry, digital area and plan your export strategy in detail. Expand your horizons. Brexit can be an opportunity, that's for sure, uh, but it needs to be planned carefully. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Mike. You, Mike. Um, I um, just want to check, check, does anybody, does anybody any, any questions, questions Mike, going to the webinar? webinar? Just to just let you know, you know the, the uh, slides, uh, slides will be will circulated, be circulated after, after the, the uh, uh, webinar. webinar. Nope. I think, I think, um, um, I think um, um, you can all base it, no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. I'm, I'm sure, I hope it was interesting. Nope, just nope, just again, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, yeah, so if you've so got any questions, questions um, um, We'll probably, we'll probably blend, blend the, the uh, webinar, webinar now. now. Uh, just, uh, just then say big thank, thank you for today's, today's uh, webinar. And so thank you for everybody for attending. Um, the the um, presentations will be circulated. And if you've got any questions, um, feel free to email the International Trade Mailbox. Thank you very much. Diochavar.